Today we're joined by Kenneth Clay of Corinthian Capital Group, Bob Nolan of Halyard Capital, and Steve Milner of Gen2 Fund Services. Gentlemen, welcome to ProCap today. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Thank David. You. We're talking about things that you all wished you'd known, or in your case, your clients wished they had known uh, before launching a private equity firm. We have two private equity firm founders with us, and also, Steve, you helped many private equity firms get launched. So I'd love to get your views on investors. Um, is it safe to say that LP due diligence is exceptionally um, thorough these days, and even if you enjoyed sort of star status at the firm you were at, uh, they're still going to rake you over the coals uh, looking at your track record and assessing your team. Maybe, Kenneth, you can talk about your process of, of spinning out and kind of the, the level of due diligence that you were subject to as you tried to raise your first fund. Sure. Well, the, the level of diligence at that time was high, and it's, it's only gotten higher. I would say that the most critical thing, in addition to obviously doing good deals, is to have attribution. If you think about things from the investor's perspective, there's an awful lot of product out there. Uh, they, they have made a buy decision, if you will, on your old fund. They're invested, uh, and therefore, uh, they're going to look at things with a critical eye, but they are certainly pulling for your success uh, because they own it. And uh, when you spin out on your own, uh, that level of goodwill may or may not follow you. Certainly, it's not likely to follow you to the same extent. And uh, investors hate uncertainty. And with a new firm, there are lots of moving pieces, and the uncertainty level is higher. And so it's just going to be different. And I think uh, lots of GPs are probably, strike that, lots of, of deal doers are probably um, surprised at the level of scrutiny. Not that they don't wish you well, but uh, it's just a new game. I think that most GPs are aware that there's going to be increased scrutiny. I think that Madoff was the bright line where investors who typically relied upon relationships and knew where they wanted to invest money could do so, frankly, almost unbridled, changed everything and regulation and compliance kicked into a higher degree. I think the best reference for me is as a third party administrator, we plug into a lot of new funds and funds going to market as part of their backbone. And we never saw in investors come and check us out, come in, do due diligence, make sure we got a business continuity plan, that we have manuals, that we have all the right accreditations. Everything changed. We actually had to make our conference room much nicer <laughs> to accommodate <laughs> <laughs> the folks we were coming to see. So I think, you know, that's my reference point. Bob, you spun out of a larger organization. Uh, Kenneth just mentioned attribution. Is that something that is especially uh, kind of the most intense part of due diligence for, for a newer group? Without question. Um, and particularly when you're spinning out of a large institution because the, the suspicion is that somehow the institution subsidized both the deal sourcing and assisted in the deal doing. Um, it was a little bit different in our case because we were brought there to structure a fund and then to um, implement the fund. So a little bit different, and I ended up running their merchant bank, which included 70 separate fund investments. So at the time we spun out, I had had, I thought, significant experience in the role of LP, let alone GP. Um, but to Kenneth's earlier comments, uh, I would say it was a different level, and I think the biggest change for me, and, and, and Steve touched on it as well, was the involvement of advisors and their extra layer of due diligence number one, and then of course the increased scrutiny under both, not only Madoff, but the financial crisis, yeah. which has the LPs looking at their rotation of capital much more closely at that time, a little less so today, but very much so at that time, and that increased the scrutiny that they brought to bear on the new fundraising. It's also the case that different LPs have different ways of looking at track records, right? And that's something that uh, it, it pays to be aware of, uh, right Bob? Yes, no question, and I think that was a revelation to me in particular. Um, <clears throat> I had lived inside a public institution, and so we reported quarterly, and any marks we made was, were immediately reported as either income or, God forbid, the other side. With respect to the institutional LP market, there are different categories of need. Some are much more quarterly focused, and as a result, IRR becomes the governing standard, which is why you have a lot of leveraged recapitalizations by large funds who can do them more readily. and, and and deliver dividends because it will deliver a greater IRR. It will eventually impact the multiple of invested capital they deliver on that deal just because of the increased leverage. 
It depends on the nature of the investor. A family office or an endowment may look more for a multiple of invested capital achievement as opposed to an IRR. So as a fund that was more, a pr more focused on growth-orientated companies, we tend to pursue multiple of invested capital. And it was just surprising to me how many people wanted quarterly uh, deliverance of, of uh, capital return and, of course, gains. It was just a new uh, revelation to me. Steve, would you give any advice to someone thinking of spinning out as far as getting their ducks in a row before they leave an institution? Yeah, so we've been involved in a couple of these spin-offs. I think largely uh, the lawyers need to be involved in terms of how, when there's a departing group, what information can be shared, how track records work, and that's an important element and consideration uh, when a group is planning a departure, especially, I'm assuming it's friendly, track record attribution is really key. Um, the second part, and we've done a couple of these now, is we have to actually reconstruct track record. Because sometimes you're running capital on a proprietary basis, and the structure of the economics, there may not be a management fee, the carry may be different in internally managed funds as opposed to externally managed funds. And we've actually had to reconstruct uh, several track records to conform with what's currently being offered to give the investor a better sense of what the return profile would look to them. And I think all of that has the effect of, again, raising the bar because if you are an LP and you're evaluating a number of different investment alternatives, and keep in mind each dollar is binary, right? If, if, uh, if I give it to you, I can't give it to you. And so they've got to have a good reason to go through a reconstructed track record to assess the infrastructure which is all new and to support that new GP. Gen2 is a leading independent private equity administrator. Uh, we have over 65 billion dollars of capital under administration making us one of the largest independent non-bank administrators globally. We deliver a platform to our clients, a platform that consists of people, process, and technology. Think about us as the people who prepare your capital call letters, distribution notices. We prepare financial statements. We compute performance metrics, IRRs, multiples. And lastly, we track the preferred return, compute the waterfall, and the carried interest. Our objective is to enable our clients to deliver to their limited partners best-in-class reporting, while at the same time enabling their organization to really focus on their investment portfolio.